My guest today has made herself incredibly successful. She has taught tens of thousands how to teach others uh, to be happier, stronger, more successful, Marissa Peer. So I think if you wanted to be me, although you should really be the best version of you, it was crazy. My father was my head teacher. I went to his school and that, you know, I always felt like a freak. We were told, oh, your school days are the best days of your life and it's all downhill. And I thought, actually, that's not true. It, it isn't always the best. It can be horrible for some of us and amazing for others. I, I love that. I love that you bring it back to this is about what I can do with me. You always get the chance to frame it. You may not get what you want, but often you get the thing that you're meant to have. Your thoughts are yours to challenge, change, and upgrade all the time. Welcome back. Uh, this is the first episode of 2024, and I could not give you a bigger uh, gift. Uh, you know, New Year's, New You, uh, your intentions, your building, uh, hopefully what would be a better fit for your dreams by the end of 2024. And my guest today uh, is none other than uh, Marissa Peer. Marissa does not require an introduction of anyone I know in the world who speaks about manifestation and intentions and all of those things. Marissa actually speaks about all the sides of what really needs to be done for you to uh, remove your limitations and become uh, the best version of yourself. She has made herself incredibly successful. She has taught tens of thousands, uh, probably close to 100,000 therapists, how to teach others uh, to be happier, uh, stronger, more successful. And she has reached with her teaching uh, hundreds of thousands of people, probably millions of people uh, that used her model, uh, the rapid uh, transformation therapy uh, and all of her knowledge um, documented in many, many uh, bestsellers uh, to, uh, to really change from within. Uh, today is my very first day in uh, my permanent studio here in Dubai. And uh, I thought, well, that's probably the best combination. Uh, I wish you all a very happy new year, but also a very successful new year. And my gift to you is Marissa Pierre. Uh, Marissa, thank you so much for being here. I am a huge fan. Well, I am too. So we just fan each other because I'm a massive fan <laughs> I mean, of you as well. I can't actually believe that you would be a fan of my work. I've studied everything about what you do. I love everything uh, that you've contributed. I love what you stand for. I love the way that you do it. And uh, it's actually hard for me <laughs> to to think, I mean, I'm, I'm new to the scene and I, it's hard for me to think that my work uh, actually registers with you. Well, of course I write books too. And I think anyone that writes a book with a message like your book about how even in grief, you can actually get, because so many people feel they can never get past it. They're just stuck at a set point of pain. And I think your book had a very important message that although you're in tremendous pain, yeah. if you can, there's always something around the corner if you only just knew it. Absolutely. Um, can I ask you a very uh, 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 selfish question, which I ask to my idols all the time. How do I become Marissa Pierre? How did you become Marissa Pierre? Do you know, I became Marissa Peer because I was always curious. And of course, I learned much later that the word cure comes from the word curious. If oh. you want to cure anything, get curious. How did I get this? Why did I get it? Why does this happen? Why do I always get depressed on a Sunday afternoon? What is going on? One of my first do ever... Do you get depressed on a Sunday afternoon? No, but one of my first ever clients, <laughs> I always remember to this day, this client was when I was newly qualified. And that was this thing every Sunday at four o'clock. I become deeply depressed, so traumatically depressed, and it lasts right through until Thursday, and then it lifts, but it always comes back. And of course, the first thing to think of is why would your mind do that? The mind isn't random. The mind doesn't randomly go, let me ruin your life every Sunday. Let me every Sunday make you feel terrible. Mm -hmm. There's something going on because the mind, as we know, is highly systemized. It links things to things. You might say, when I smell lavender, I think of my grandmother, when I heard that I hate the word Ian because my head teacher was called Ian and he was horrible. Mm. So the mind will always link. So, we, so I was very curious with this particular person. And it was all to do with being taken to boarding school. He came home every Friday night, went back every Sunday, hated it. And the parents didn't understand. And 
And so long after he'd stopped going to war, he was only 60 by then, but still had this deep depression. So I think it's the curiosity of, rather than, you know, just be curious, be fascinated. I find my most difficult clients, if you can be fascinated, go, well, this is fascinating. This is so interesting. Look at you. Everything going to go, that won't work. That's not going to work. And I think if you can just put everything aside and be fascinated by people and go, well, why would they do that? And what's going on there? And so I think it was the learning to be super curious and believing that, you know, no, because no baby is born saying, I can't sleep at night. I, I can't resist <laughs> cake. I, I hate being the center of attention. I blush if you look at me. I'm having a bad day. A baby, whether it's nappy is running or its nose is running or it's got no hair and teeth, or look at you, that big gummy smile, and go, oh, yeah. my gorgeous. You're mm -hmm. just here to see how lovable I am. And I was always fascinated by where does that go? How can we lose that so quickly for some of us? So I think if you wanted to be me, although you should really be the best version of you, just be super curious about everything, because in curiosity you find the answers. The answers always come by being really curious. We, we, we are taught as children to stop being I know, curious. don't ask yeah. questions. I want yeah. never gets. Yeah. Stop I mean, being a nuisance. And, and, and just listen to what you're told and yeah. don't, uh, you know, don't argue with the teacher. Yeah. And I, I remember one of my favorite moments in my life. I, I'm, ve I'm a very serious math geek and I love mathematics. And, you know, when, when we were, I think in third, third grade or something, one of my uh, colleagues, who's still a very good friend of mine, a brilliant engineer, uh, tells the geometry uh, teacher who says, if two lines are not parallel, they will cross, at, mm. uh, 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 intersect at a point, even if it's far. And she draws two lines on the blackboard uh, and, you know, they appear to have to, to will intersect, you know, like a meter away. And he raises his hand very curiously and he goes like, but miss, miss, um, it's not always true. And she says, what? I said, if they're not parallel, they'll intersect. And he said, so what are those? And he holds his uh, arms out like this. Yes. They're not parallel and they don't intersect. And I remember, and it really affected my life. She said, those are nothing. Yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean they're nothing? They are here. Like th they're not parallel and they don't intersect. And, and we're just told to I know. swallow it. Right? I mean, I love the thing that says, if you want to survive an illness, get difficult, cantankerous patient written on your notes. So the people who say, what's that drug? Or why should I do it? What's that going to do? What are the side effects? Why should I have that? Are the ones who do better than the ones who just take any old medication? Ah. So again, you know, at school, it's the same thing. And so what made me different as a therapist is I, I was interested in that every therapeutic modality says, bring me your pain. And I'm going to fix it. If you broke your tooth, you go to the dentist. If I broke my leg, I go to the doctor. If I put it on my back, I go to the chiropractor. But the only therapy that doesn't say that is therapy that says, bring me your pain. And we'll mm. build a long relationship of trust. And then you might get better. You might not, but you'll learn to just be yourself. And I always challenge that because people in pain, whether it's the pain of I can't find love, I can't keep a job, I lose my temper, or the pain of I have tension headaches or you know, I have an irritable gut or uh, my stomach always plays up. They're all in pain. And if you're in pain, you want one thing. Can you get me out of pain as okay. fast as possible? Correct. And the answer should yeah. be yes, absolutely. I'm going to get you out of pain today. So I never quite understood therapies like, well, yes, I can. But first we have to build this long relationship of getting to know each other. You know, if you I, when I was in New York, I went into anaphylactic shock on the street, which I'd never happened before. And when they got an ambulance, I didn't have to build any trust with that guy. I shoved an EpiPen in my leg, gave me some adrenaline. I felt so much better. I just trusted him because he was, had a white coat on. I figured he is going to stop my <laughs> mouth running like a puffer fish. Yeah. And so if someone is good, you trust them anyway. Yeah. If someone is good, if you have a good doctor, a good plumber, a good dentist, you already trust them and you don't ever say, we need to build this relationship now. And so I think therapy with the best of intentions, I think that is that might be good for the therapist. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's good for the client to have to spend so long when you're in pain, because when you're in pain, you don't have time to do that. Can I, can I ask you openly, I, I, don't say, I don't mean this against therapy or any specific therapist, but um, 
why is it that a therapist will take so much time? Like, is it is it mandated by the practice? Is it, uh, um, you know, I, I find it quite interesting because I be, I'm a bit like what you're saying in my approach. I'm an engineer, right? Mm -hmm. You bring me a car that's leaking oil. I'm not going to sit you down and say, hey, so tell me when you bought it. And yeah. then, you know, tell me every place you drove over. I'll, I'll look at the car and if it's leaking oil, I'll change the hose, right? It's it's very straightforward to me. And I, and you know, of course people will say, but therapy will make sure that it doesn't leak oil again. Mm -hmm. I understand that, so, but why does it have to take so long? Do you know, the only answer I have is that therapy was invented in the 50s. We had a lot of time. <laughs> yes, women yeah, on the whole one, we you know more women go to therapy than men. Maybe they like to go every Wednesday afternoon to their <laughs> therapist because it got them out of that. I don't really know. But you see, a lot of things that we say, like when I first started to do therapy on Skype, it was that you can't do that. This is wrong. But actually what I found is if I'm working with a suicidal teenager or a very unhappy teen and I turn up on their screen, they like that because their life is I'm on my screen in my bedroom. If I go to come to your office and I'm this damaged, messed up kid, I'm going to be really resistant. But if you turn up on my screen, I'm going to feel much better. So I found that for many of my clients, they prefer therapy online. And why would we say that doesn't work? Because when it was invented, we didn't have computers. So they couldn't have had online therapy or even telephone therapy in the 50s. It was a whole different life. It was slower, more sedate. And I can only imagine that that's why they got into this long, complex, complicated therapy. And there's something called HEBS that actually has now proven that long therapy if it's too long, actually completely reverses all the effects. Mm. And, and so and so, while there is a lot of evidence that uh, there is progress with uh, RTT, for example, yes. that can happen very yeah. quickly, uh, there is still, I think, that business model sometimes yeah. of, okay, look, you're paying by session. Uh, we're going to keep you here for 10, 12 sessions. Of course, and it is a business model. Mm. And it's the same thing with, with, you know, getting a tutor for your child and saying we've got to do this for a year when, in fact, if you use hypnosis within tutoring, you can get a kid to learn a language or be really good at maths really fast. Seriously? Yeah, I, I do that all the time with T children. Tell me what hypnosis is. Is it like we see in the movies, like, you know, uh, you can tell me to do whatever? No. And then, okay. no. So <laughs> hip, something quite magical happens in hypnosis, and it doesn't happen out of hypnosis. And that is you have a critical factor in your mind. And if, you, if, I, if I said you mow, you're going to go and stand on a soapbox and give an anti-Donald Trump or an anti-Biden speech, your mind would go, oh, no, I can't do that because first of all, we won't like it. And what if I don't know what to say? And that's a normal thing. The critical factor says that's not going to work. You can't do that. What's the point of believing you're going to find love because the last four people dumped you? But in hypnosis, the critical factor shuts down completely. And you can tell people things they wouldn't normally accept, like you're not going to feel a thing when you have this dental work. You can give birth to your baby under hypnosis. You can give that great talk. You're really amazing at math. You're phenomenal at IT. Everyone likes you. So the first thing is that critical factor shuts down and the mind accepts comments it wouldn't normally accept. They have to be things you want. So if you said to me, hey, I want to be an amazing speaker, an amazing parent, an amazing writer, then I could probably hypnotize you to do that because you already have the interest. If you can I be a brain surgeon, I'd say, well, you have to still got to go to college for many, <laughs> many years. The second thing is that the body is run by a network of intelligence, which is influenced by the mind. And in hypnosis, you can actually get into that network. And two things happen. The mind will send very different messages to the body, but also interpret the messages coming back differently. So instead of saying, I'm nervous, you think, I'm excited, I'm not prepared, I'm ready, I can do this. And it's an amazing, powerful thing that really only happens in hypnosis. Those three things combined, critical factor shuts down, body is sending different, mind is sending different messages to the body, and interpreting. mind is different messages coming back, makes you able to do things that you simply couldn't do. So a couple of years ago, my husband got asked to speak at an event. He went, oh, I don't really want to do this. Can you do it? And I said, sure, I'll do it. So we went off to Portugal to speak at this very prestigious event they said, hey, John, we really want you to speak. And he said, and I said, look, let me hypnotize you. 
So, because then he said he would speak, but then when they gave him, they went, oh my God, I'm speaking for 90 minutes. I thought it was 20 minutes. I said, let me hypnotize you. Speaking is great if you love it. And so I hypnotized him. When I finished, he sat up and he literally ran out of the room, went on stage, gave the most amazing speech. It was like, come on, it's my turn now. You're still on there. <laughs> 90 minutes has become 100 minutes. And when he came off, everyone was talking and saying how much they loved it. And So, so how, how, how do you hypnotize him? What, what do you do? Do you, is there... Like, again, is it like the movies with the pendulum? No, or? hypnosis is really about the eyes. So we have different, alpha, beta, delta, theta, brain waves. And when you look up like that, as you know, if you have a child who's about to get a baby, they kind of roll up their eyes and think, oh, yes, they're going to sleep now. And if you do that with your child, it'll mm. help them go to sleep. So when you look up, keep the eyeballs up, but close the lids down, you go into that alpha brain wave when you were much more receptive to suggestions. Mm -hmm. So a kid who says, you know, I can't remember anything, I fall apart in exams. So what I would do first is hypnotize them, get them to roll up their eyes, close them down, and then start to tell them things. You you have an amazing memory. You remember every everything you revise with this exam is stored in your mind in perfect sequence. Because the trick is not to do that every day and everywhere getting better and better, but to make it specific. You have a phenomenal memory. You have the most enviable powers of concentration, comprehension, retention, assimilation. When you read that question, your brilliant genius mind has already found the answer. It's a bit like typing into Google. Yeah. So you make it, you must excite the imagination. The imagination likes to be turned on by specific words that make a powerful picture. So saying you're good at exams is not as good as saying you have a genius brain. As you read the question, it goes into your memory bank and puts the answer in your head and it stays as you've written it and then does it again and again. And so if you make that suggestion for someone and then record it and they play it every night and then you give them a little clue, as you go in the exam, you say, the minute I read that question, my genius brain finds the answer. That will happen because, you know, what's so simple about the mind is that it, it's always acting on what you tell it. Whatever you think you're making, every thought you think has a physical reaction and an emotional response. So when you say, I go blank in exams, I fall apart in exams, I, I just, I'm so nervous I can't even read the question, that becomes real. And when you say, I'm so cool and calm and chilled and my brain is so on it that as I read the question, of course I remember it because every book I've ever read, every lesson I've sat through, it's stored in there for me. That's exactly what happened. So you're not even doing anything different because every day we think a thought and our body makes it. If I think of something embarrassing, I might go bright red. If I think of something sad, my eyes will fill up with tears. If I think of food, my stomach will rumble. Mm. And if you give me a drug, what I think of it will have more of an effect on me than what it actually is. What we think about a drug, what we believe it's going to do will do more. That's what the placebo is. So we already know this is happening every day. I have a terrible memory. It becomes I have a phenomenal memory. And and a reliable, enviable, dependable memory. So if our mind's job is to make our thoughts real, and it is, then we have to understand our job is to think better thoughts all the time so our mind can make them real. So it's not complicated, it's really simple. Your mind's going to do its job. Why don't you do your job better? Think better thoughts all the time. This is going to go wrong. It's going to be amazing. Who's going to love me? Who couldn't love me? I'm oh, not wow. smart. I'm super smart. When my little girl used to set off for school and she'd always turn around and go, what have you remembered? She goes, my swimming costume. I never saw if you've forgotten. I go, what have you remembered? She goes, I've remembered my lunch. I said, that's good. You see how when you get to the door, you remember because you have an amazing memory. I never said, oh God, every day you get to the door and then we have to go back because you've forgotten. So it's really just about reframing everything. Isn't this life itself? I mean, relationships, friendships, uh, work, uh, everything really is all about that sort of positive reinforcement, positive reframing. Everything is a reframe. Your whole life is a reframe. And you have the joy of reframe. So a lot of people say to me, you know, I'm a single parent. How am I going to find love? I say, you've already got love. Aren't you lucky you have oh. love? You have this beautiful baby. So you're not, oh, I haven't got any love, I'm alone. You've already got love and now you can compound on that and find more love. 
because you've got love already. So everything is a reframe. You know, it's like kids at school who believe, you know, I was working with this little kid recently who said, I'm not good at um, English. I'm only good at computers. I said, darling, you know, you're supposed to be good at one thing. Imagine if the whole world was all good at everything. Mm. Nobody ever pay for a gardener or a decorator <laughs> or a mechanic. And it wouldn't be fair to be good at everything. You, your gift is computers and IT. You don't have to be good at anything else. And when people say, can't you be good at everything? Say, my gift is computers. You're supposed to be a master of one, not a jack of all trades, but you're supposed to be good at one thing. So even when your teacher and parents say, why can't you learn Spanish? Go, because I'm good at computers. That's my gift. And so giving kids the power to say, this is my unique skill set. This is where I'm going to go. And like, I don't need to learn Latin. What is that going to take me? Correct. And of course, in parts of Scandinavia, kids now self-select their lessons. They all go to the ones they're good at because mm -hmm. that's where they're going to go in their career anyway. So I think if we could just see that if you can reframe everything, like I remember talking to John Gray once. He said, I'm so glad my first wife was awful. So if she hadn't been, I wouldn't have left her and found my second wife, who's an angel. So that's a reframe. Mm. I'm so glad my first marriage didn't work, because if it had, I wouldn't be with this beautiful person now. One of my friends had four miscarriages and then adopted a child and said, you know, I'm so glad now, because if I hadn't lost those four, I wouldn't have her. And she was meant to be my daughter and I was meant to be her mother. So that's a great reframe. That is definitely what it's all about. I mean, I say that about the most unfortunate event of my life. Yeah. Like losing losing Ali for me is the reason you and I are, are speaking, sure. is the reason, you know, I his message reached so many people and so on. So but, many. but 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 I th I think when you when you were saying it, I always thought of it in my head as a a brain defect almost because I I have a brain defect, I'll tell you openly. If anyone's done something before, to me it's doable. And so when I start to do it, I'm like yeah, I'm probably gonna, you know, mess up a couple of times, but I'm gonna do it, right? If I wanna build a very complex fish tank with a whatever inside, I'll say, yeah, I saw it on YouTube, so it's doable. I'll give it a couple of tries. Maybe it will work the first time, but it will it will definitely work eventually, right? When, when it came to writing a book, I'm an engineer, English is not my first language. You know, I'm not really a writer, if you think about it. And I was like, yeah, but you speak nicely to friends and you can convince them of things and others have written books, you might as well. And I think that sort of brain defect, if you want, has always told me that I can do anything. And, yeah. and, and accordingly, I did so many things and it's quite shocking for a lot of people how I can do mosaics and play music and, you know, and draw and write and, uh, you know, do mathematics at the same time. It's because I believe I can. And so I give, I give it the effort. Yeah. And you see, nobody could ever know what their potential is because your potential expands as you move towards it. You know, years mm. ago when Mark Spitz won the Olympics in 1984, he was like a hero, but now you can't get into the swimming team at that speed because it's yes. been broken again and again. So as you get to your potential, it moves and it moves and it moves. You can never reach it because it keeps <laughs> expanding. But when your mind expands in new dimensions, it doesn't ever go back. So when you write a book, you think, well, I can write another one or I can design, I can create, I can do this because we have so much untapped potential. And we should never see it as fun. Oh, I've reached my potential. You you will never reach it, which mm -hmm. is a wonderful thing because it mm -hmm. means it's you can journey. keep going. Yeah, yeah, it's a journey. And there's no destination called potential. Just that there's no destination called happiness. There isn't a terminal you ever get to call, this is happiness, this is Done. potential. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the journey is yeah. the happiness and the journey is the potential. The, the way you say it, Marissa, is so inspiring. I hope people feel it, uh, you know, on video and in audio, because I'm sitting in front of you feeling invincible, honestly. Yes. I'm, I'm like thinking to myself, wow, that's actually very, very true. It's, it, is, it is all about hmm, what you believe you can yeah. do. If you, if you think about it from a mathematics point of view, if you have one unit of creativity or, you know, effort or whatever, yeah. capability, most of us, the problem is we take 80% of that and we take it away through criticism and disbelief and yeah. self-limiting beliefs, right? It's not, it's not, whatever it is that you have, whether it's one or 10 units, by taking it away with your negativity, you're not, you know, operating at your actual potential. Yeah. And, and, you know, 
that's that's that reframing goes. I was working with a girl whose a family member was abusing her, and she tried to tell her mother, who just wouldn't believe it. And then she got contact dermatitis all over her thigh. So if you touched her thigh, her skin would just come off. And the person abusing her found that so repellent that he left her alone. And the reframe is. Can you see what a genius you are? What a genius you are. To, your mind came up with that. Your mind came up with, I've got to help you at all costs. Mother doesn't believe you. Let me repel that man. Because a small child will think something like, I've got to stop that man touching me. I've got to stop that person looking at me like that, lusting after my body. i, I got to stop it. And the mind, which is the genie, and your wish is its command, will go ahead and find a way. So... Strange things happen, like contact dermatitis, becoming obese, getting an illness, becoming sick. And then, of course, it, it actually works. Mm. And that's the genius of humans. That they, th I, You know, I worked with a little kid who got chronic migraines every time his parents fought. And they immediately stopped fighting. The mother would call him her little snake because they had to lie in the dark and the cold. She put cold flannels on his head. And, of course, they weren't shouting. So again, isn't that a genius that his brilliant mind, when he said, I gotta stop them fighting, came up with a way immediately, which were these chronic vascular migraines, which are very unusual in a small mm. child. But it's always the reframe. Look, if you came up with that when you were seven, and that makes perfect sense, any kid of seven, you don't have a lot of options when you're seven, but that was a good one. But now that you're 37, you don't need it anymore. That's the point. So, yeah. so, so some of those which would work really well for you yeah. at a, in a situation would would linger, right? Yeah. And so, how do we get out? They, of that? That's the thing about the lingering because the mind. Once the mind believes this works, I found a way. You know, you know. I work with a lot of people who are overweight, and I say, look, when you're a kid and your mom and dad are shouting, or you're failing your exams, you come home from school and there's no one there. The only option is food. A kid puts their hand in the cookie jar and they can forget that mum and dad are working until nine o'clock or they don't have any friends or they have, there's nothing nice in the house. But once the mind learns, oh, food changes my state, it doesn't know how to unlearn it. So 40 years later, they still got their hand in the cookie jar, yeah. still eating toast or potato chips to alleviate stress because once the mind learns this works, it will keep going until you or a therapist, but you can do it yourself. Go back and get them. I say, I don't need that anymore. Mm -hmm. So if I went back to the man I talked about in the beginning with a depression, his story was so interesting because his parents were very well off. And every Sunday they'd take him back to boarding school and he would be hysterical. One day he went and stood in a stream at the end of their garden. So they couldn't get him, and he stood and said, I don't want to go. This was obviously years ago because I must have seen him 30 years ago. And he was probably 45, so we're talking like 70 years ago. They called out the family doctor who, had, who gave him a tranquilizer. No way. They probably thought, My God. And then after that, they would tranquilize his food every lunchtime, put oh a tranquilizer God. in his food. And he would wake up. And then in... he'd wake up at boarding school. So he would oh fall asleep, God. put him in the car, and then he'd wake up at boarding school. Very, just a very upset because he, so this was the cause of the depression. But here's the reframe. Because he was like, how could they do that? But they didn't get out Google and go, hey, Google, how can we ruin our kid's life? Let's type something in there. Mo very few parents wake up and say, how can I ruin this kid's life? They probably were quite good people who couldn't bear to see him so upset and thought, this is a wonderful thing. The family doctors recommended it. You know, family doctors used to give you Valium. They used to smoke <laughs> when they delivered your baby. So... They probably thought, oh, what a great idea. So the reframe is they weren't bad people. They were people who didn't know how to handle your emotional state mm. and just ignored it. And all these years later, you don't know how to handle your emotional state because they learned to drug you. But the reframe is they probably are actually good people who thought, oh, poor son. Well, we got to stop this. And so the reframe is, were my parents really bad when they sent me to school, when they punish me for not doing well. You know, most parents, if they could do better, would do better. And so a lot of the reframe is thinking, actually, you know, we, we don't realize that when our parents have us, they're not even grown up. Yeah. They're so immature, they're growing up, with they don't know what to do. Yeah, you know, when no I had idea. my child, I didn't actually know that my job as a parent was to raise her self-esteem. Nobody told me that until much later. Oh, that's my job. 
if I'd known that was my job, I would have done it much better. I was so busy, I've got to give her organic broccoli and send her to a nice school and make sure she's doing well. But actually, that wasn't my job at all. My job was to raise a kid with healthy. So, and the job of every school is the same. It doesn't matter if your kid speaks Mandarin. It doesn't <laughs> matter how good they are. If they do not have high self-esteem, then you've completely failed. Yeah. And so a lot of times parents, are, you know, they just don't understand. And we don't understand that our parents have their own issues. I mean, my parents should never have got married. They were so unhappy together. And, of course, that affected the way they raised us. They were always fighting, screaming, shouting. It was always high drama. But, you know, when I... When I was in a relationship myself that wasn't working, I had great sympathy for my mother. Oh, God, I can just leave. But she couldn't leave. She was No wonder she was the way she was because she was stuck. Mm. But my I, I've got my own money. I can just go. And I did. But then I had compassion for her. So I think a lot of it is look, look back at the scene and understand the scene didn't affect you as much as what you believed the scene was, how you interpreted what the... the the, the beliefs you attach to the scene and what affects you, and you can change those. And, of course, you did that so beautifully with your son. I mean, you can never change what happens, but you did an amazing job of changing the meaning. And when you do that, it, it does change everything. Can I be the devil's advocate for a minute? Sure. So, so, you know, one of the things that my, if you want... Uh, masculine doing brain, if you want, always is interested in, is that the world changes when, not only when you change, so your state of being, okay, but also when you do the work, yeah. right, your state of doing. And I have to say, I fear a little bit that uh, this is missed, especially on the internet, where mm. people, you know, when, when you go to someone and say, you have an incredible memory, right? Yeah. Uh, I can understand that because, you know, through neuroplasticity, you can actually yeah, exactly. make things change, right? Uh, but if you go to someone and, you know, uh, say, for example, um, how, your f how your friends might tell you, oh, by the way, you're amazing, he's an asshole, he left because of him, you did absolutely nothing wrong, you're gorgeous, mm. you're a goddess. OK, or the other way around, sure. you know, um, tell a man, you know, the, he, he, you know, the women are difficult. This is why she left. You know, it's not your mistake. You did everything right. We're sort of creating limiting beliefs, not limiting. They're, they're, they're liberating beliefs, but they're not mm. true. Right. Yeah. And they don't lead to action. How do you distinguish, you know, when you should tell yourself, I am this and that, and it's actually true, it's part of you, like yeah. I, I am good with uh, computers, okay? And stop yourself from saying that about Spanish, when you're not good yeah. with Spanish. Well, first of all, it's not what other people tell you. Your friends can say, you're amazing, you're an idiot, you're wonderful, you're boring, you're, you're, <laughs> in, you're too much, you're not enough. It's really what you tell yourself. When Correct. our friends say things, we understand there's an agenda. If I said to you, oh, Mo, you're amazing and you're fantastic and you're wonderful. By the way, can I borrow this studio next week? I've used praise to totally manipulate you. We understand uh, that. Marissa, that, that hurts my... <laughs> of course, my darling, you can borrow we, anything, I know, anytime. I we understand yeah. that, <laughs> yeah. you know, a lot of people say, what do you want? You know, if you yeah. go home, you say something nice to your partner, what do you want? Or your kid comes up and says, mommy, and you go, what, what do you want? Because we, yeah. we know that, that when we praise or indeed criticize others, we normally have an agenda. I'm having a bad day, so I'm going to be mean to you. And then a miserable man finds a more miserable man feels a bit better. So we understand that. It's a bit like if this was a seesaw mm -hmm. and you feel inadequate and the person here doesn't, then now you see the world like that because you feel inadequate and they don't. So you only have two choices. You're going to diminish them or elevate you. Uh -huh. And what you really want to happen is that. And a lot of people are very busy diminishing yeah, correct. or elevating because they feel inadequate. So we get that. This person is mean and bitter. They're having a bad day. The problem is when you're mean and bitter about yourself, your mind can't say you're having a bad day. So when you say, I'm an idiot, I'm a loser, I've got rocks for brains, everything I touch falls apart, I just can't be motivated, my relationships never work out, the mind doesn't see an agenda, it sees it as it must be true because you said it. 
Hmm. And so it's the words that you say about you that cause the most harm, but also the most benefit. So if you can start to say every day, I'm a good person, I got a good heart, I do have a gift, I have a talent, I have my own skill set, I'm significant, I'm enough, then they will sink in just like butter sinks into toast. Because just and like toast, true. just like toast can't reject the butter if it's yeah. horrible, disgusting, cheap margarine, mm -hmm. it'll still go in. So of course, if you start to say things like I'm a rocket scientist or I'm a goddess or I'm a rock star, the mind goes, well, but you're not really because you don't have a <laughs> goddess's apartment and yeah. you don't have a rock star's income. So you will start to doubt it. So therefore, you have to use words that you can't doubt. I'm enough. I mean, how could you doubt that? I'm lovable. I matter. I'm here for a reason. Somebody wanted me to be here because here I am. So it's very important when you're giving yourself, I don't use affirmations, I call them statements of truth. You use ones that you can't argue against. I'm a lovable person. I go, yeah, but I've got fat legs. So what? So lovable. Very lovely. I don't have yeah. any hair, so what? I'm so, I don't have a great apartment. It's when you tell yourself things like, you know that song, hey, I'm a rock star, I got my rock moves. People go, yeah, but really I don't, I, don't, I live in an apartment with four other people. I don't, it's not really a rock star. So you've got to give yourself suggestions that you can't argue against. I'm a good person. I've got a good heart. I matter. I'm likable, I'm lovable, I'm enough. I have something to offer the world. You might go, what is it? I don't know, yeah, but yeah. I do have something. And so we, we, we got to sort of separate what are we looking for? Because you're, you're talking about words that come with feelings. And so the opposite of I'm enough is I'm not enough. I don't matter. I'm not significant. I'm not good at anything. I don't even know why I'm here. And it's the harsh, hurtful, critical words that we say about ourselves on a daily basis that cause depression. If your boss said, oh, you're rubbish, or if your ex said, I don't know why I ever got together with you, you can go, I think they're having a bad day. But when you say, I don't matter, and I'm rubbish, and I've got nothing going on, that is one of the major causes of depression. And of course, when you're depressed, you can't outsource that to someone else and go, can you tell me I'm okay? Because people are telling people every day, you're good, you're okay, you're lovely. They go, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand that it's the outsourcing that makes it go wrong. It's your job and only your job to go, I, I'm a good person. I do matter, I'm here for a reason, I do have a skill. And even though you might go, but I don't even believe it, it doesn't matter, you ought to keep saying it because the mind learns by repetition. And if, as you say, I matter, I'm lovable, I'm significant, I'm enough, you'll find some things happen. Some people say, I feel really angry when I say that. I feel angry with you, Marissa, for telling me to say it. Well, that's okay. You're angry because you don't believe it. So here's the solution. Keep saying it until you until do. You do. <laughs> some people say, I feel tearful when I say that. I well up because you don't believe it. Keep saying it until you do. Some people say, you know, I feel it's silly, but Muhammad Ali said, I told myself I was the greatest before I even was. I said it. It wasn't true. But you know what happened? It became true. Mm. So there's a concept. Say something good about yourself, even if you don't believe it, because the mind learns by repetition. It loves what is familiar. And the mind will always, it's one of the most vexing things for therapists, that the human mind loves what's familiar and doesn't like what it doesn't know. So when you're saying I'm a good person and it's not familiar, you feel angry or sad or annoyed or think it's silly. But if you keep going, it becomes familiar because if the mind likes what is familiar, which it does, then our job is to make good stuff familiar and negative stuff and make praise and criticism unfamiliar. And then the mind will keep going back to it because you've made it familiar. Just like putting a piece of silicone on you, shoving it in your eye is totally unfamiliar. But if you do it every day, it becomes super easy. <laughs> so, so you 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 believe that everyone is enough? Yeah, of course I do. Everyone is enough. I mean, nobody everyone is, is beautiful. beautiful. Well, I've never met a baby yet that's been born been born, and you could shut it in a cupboard and it would just lie there and not cry. Mm -hmm. All babies born with a sense, because after all, in the womb, it's like being in the four seasons. It's always seventy five degrees. <laughs> There's yeah. someone there. You have 24-hour room service. So you're born with this new belief, which is 
Someone's going to take care of all my needs. And I have a friend who's a very famous DJ called Sammy Shoebox. And he's called that because he was put in a shoebox on the Philippines on a rubbish dump and just left there. Oh, my God. And apparently he's told the story a lot, but, you know, he cried for several days and people went past and thought it was a cat or a dog. But by day three, somebody thought, what is that sound? And they went and found a little baby in a shoebox who was adopted in America and has got his own child now and is an amazing guy. But his story is, I must have thought I was enough because I didn't cry for an hour. I cried for three days. It's a bit like a little abandoned kitten will come up and meow, you know, when you go to cafes and they come up and they keep coming back and they keep coming back because their belief is you're going to take care of me if I ask you to. And so there isn't a baby in the world who's been shut in a cupboard or shut in a shoebox and thought, well, I just lie here. Mm -hmm. What's the point? So we're born with this belief that we matter and we're enough and we're here for a reason. And, of course, anyone with a baby will say, you know, they cry at three in the morning, so annoying, or just when we've gone to sleep, they want to wake up because they have this belief. Every baby's born knowing they're enough. And it's what happens to that, that we should be not, did I have it? Of course you had it. The question is, where is it now? Because it usually hasn't gone. It's just been buried under other stuff. I'm not enough because they have streaming in my school and my mom said I should have been a boy or my dad said I should have been a girl or I was meant to be the family accountant and I I can't even do math. So it's never was I born believing I was enough. It's yes, you were. Yeah. Where did it go? And how quickly can you resurrect it? Where did it go is really the question. I I mean, I normally ask myself uh, openly, I I think the big observation is is you go on a dating site, Mm -hmm. right? And everyone is beautiful for someone. Right. Of so, 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 so the every question, pan has its lid. My cor- grand used to say that every yeah, pan correct, has a lid. Right. And so, everyone is enough for somebody f- for for somebody or something or some mission or some you know purpose and so on. Everyone matters for those yeah. that they matter to. And I think the problem with us is that I don't know where that came from. The question is where we, did we lose it? Maybe because of school and telling us that we have to be as good in geography as we are in math, sure. as we are, or maybe we're not good enough if we don't do, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, extracurricular activities or whatever that is. And and I think the trick here is, no, you are, you're amazing. It's yeah. just enough for what? And you're absolutely enough, uh, you know, uh, matter to who and absolutely you matter, beautiful in the eyes of who and you absolutely are. And and I think the trick is reframing because if you start to say, oh, but seven people think I'm fat uh, or I'm too skinny or I'm too short or I'm too tall or I'm too whatever, the, the, the way you teach me is to say, no, no, three people think I'm the shit. Right, and that's the whole point. Yeah, and, and I think I am too because and, and the because most of that I am. Is yours. Yeah, yeah, because of that I am, yeah. and and I think that's the trick. You know, if you, you the first time I shaved my head, I was like, okay, you know, it's not really that I had a choice, but I, I, you know, I was hoping that the world would like it, and you know, as I started to feel that the world was saying, ah, oh, that's not too bad, you're actually handsome, and then you know what, I started to tell myself that. Yeah. And I wouldn't grow hair for the world. I mean, not that I can. But the other way around is you can tell yourself that first. Because when you elevate that sense of, I like it, I feel good, I feel comfortable, the world will join you at that level. So when you're saying to them, do you like my hair? They go, no. You go, oh, do you like it? Well, it's all right. But when you go, I really like it. I feel good with my hair like that. Because the most important opinion is your opinion. And it's, again... What we do a lot is we outsource yeah. that. And then schools do a terrible job. You know, streaming is a dreadful thing that schools do. We've all heard that expression, comparison is a thief of joy. But a school does that. They compare. You know, a, a very, when I had my kid, they're going, you know, is your kid walking yet? Can they feed themselves yet? Are they? And it's this competition. How quickly can your kid <laughs> yeah. walk? get off the bottle, speak, you know, how, you know, and all these mothers, are, well, mine could do that. Mine was potty trained at, at <laughs> yeah. 10 months. You go, oh God, mine still isn't at three. And now I feel inadequate. But there's a great expression I love that says, it doesn't matter how long it takes to climb a mountain. When you get to the top, the view is the same for everybody. Yeah. You know, I think I passed, I don't know how many driving lessons I took. I think I've failed my driving test twice 
and passed it on the third time. But when you're on the road, you're all equal. No one it says, how, when, how many tests did you take? Five? <laughs> oh, my God, I passed first time. Because yeah. suddenly it doesn't matter. But at the time, it matters a great deal. So you are right. It is comparing. And we live in a world now where you can go on a website and ask people to grade you like an egg. What grade am I? We can, yeah. we, you know, we, we have social media where we are constantly compared. Yeah. Everyone's house and body and lifestyle is better than ours. Everyone's kids are better than ours. And that's what we've done. We, you know, we have an epidemic of kids with eating disorders, self-harming, using drugs to numb out because they are compared every day at school, at home. And, you know, we know that because the countries that didn't have social media had no um, instance of anorexia or bulimia. And the minute they got it, they also got epidemics oh, of wow. eating disorders. Mm -hmm. They saw that happening in Turkey and Fiji when they got piped in television shows like Beverly Hills 90210. Like, oh, I need to look like that. Mm. Apparently you got to have fat hair and a thin butt, but I've got thin hair and a fat butt, so there's something wrong with me. And that's the problem the media tells us every day. You don't conform. And we have to fight back. And it's good now that we have body shaming. And people say, you know what, this is me. I loved Lena Durham, you know, who wrote Girls. When someone said, you've got fat legs, she goes, get used to them. I'm wearing shorts when I'm 80, so you better get used <laughs> to these fat legs. I'm not going anywhere. I love that, that Absolutely. you can own it and go, yeah, you know what? My legs aren't super skinny. I do have some wrinkles. I'm not 25, but I'm here and I'm living my best life. And my job isn't to make you happy. My job is to make me happy. Mm. My job is to raise my own self-esteem. After all, it's called self-esteem. <laughs> you know, you can't raise it because <laughs> it's called, if I said I hold you in the highest esteem, I mean, I do. I think you're amazing. But self is what I think about me. And I, nobody else can do that job of raising it. I have to do it, and that's what we should be teaching in schools. How can you feel good about yourself? Because here's the thing, when you feel good about yourself, you do better academic. You tend to find your gift and pursue it, right. and the whole world would change. Right? If you could all stop the comparison and go, look, isn't it great You know that you're good at this and I'm good at that, and that's so nice. You know, I have someone who works for me called Rosie. She's a brilliant, much better writer than me. I give all my writing assignments to her. I don't get jealous of her. I think, oh, I'm so lucky that I've got this girl who is a genius. I mean, I'm a good writer, but she is a genius. It's her gift. And mm. it's such a shame we don't all recognize everyone's gift instead of getting competitive. But we get competitive because someone's told us, you're not enough. You need to shape up. And we do, of course, all need to expand and grow and develop. But you never make someone better by starting with criticism. You're so fat, why don't you get lose a bit of weight? You look such a mess, why don't you straighten up? You're so stupid, why don't you study? That it doesn't work. It works by saying, hey, you lost a few pounds. You look amazing. You're not going to lose a few pounds more now. Yeah. Because criticism withers people and praise makes them grow. But it has to be real praise. I mean, you're right. You can't go, you're amazing, you're phenomenal, you're incredible. You have to give praise, like saying to a kid, you're so good with your granddad, or you're so good with your little sister, or you're really good at this cooking this thing, or with a dog. And then if you give real praise, they, they start to follow their mm. gifts. Mm. So Marissa, when you when you were growing up and struggling with your home, when was your awakening moment? When did you choose to oh, be I there? I think I had so many. So, you know, I had an interesting life because I literally lived in a house with a white picket fence. It all looked lovely <laughs> from the outside, yeah. but inside it was crazy. My father was my head teacher. I went to his school and that, you know, I always felt like a freak. Because for children, the, our greatest need when we're born is to find connection, avoid rejection. All our life we're looking, can I find connection, avoid rejection? When you go to your father's school, you don't find connection. You find a lot of rejection. So mm. that was very strange. But of course, it gave me a great understanding of what it's like to be different. And I realized with all of my clients that most people only have three things wrong with them. If you think of an umbrella, the three things are I'm different, so I can't connect. I'm not enough, and I want them, but it's not available to me. And I found in all my years that's 
everything that's wrong with everybody. Everything else comes underneath it. Wow, well, say those again. I'm I'm, I'm different, I'm different so, so I can't, I can't connect. connect. I, I'm, I'm not, not enough. enough, you know, I'm not good enough, worthy yeah. enough. Every addict, I'm, I've worked with so many addicts, I've never met one ever who ever thought they were worthy enough, ever. And when you're not enough, you need more, more alcohol, <coughs> more drugs, more praise. And the last one, I want something that's not available. I want to be happy, I got the depressed gene. I want love, but I didn't have a dad in my last relationship. When I want success, but I'm not smart enough. And, you know, I've taught... I think nearly 17,000 therapists now. And one of the things we do is say, look, every client who comes in, look for one of those three things and treat that. So if I was treating an alcoholic or a drug addict, I'd be treating very much at the same time the not enoughness. Because if you only treat the addiction, I mean, George Michael was tr treated for an addiction. Amy Winehouse had treatment for being a bulimic, an anorexic, uh, alcoholic, and a drug, but she never had treatment for the not enoughness. And so that's always been my mission to let's treat the real issue. Mm. What I call what lies beneath. And if you can do that. So I think when I was growing up, my moments were realizing that I never felt enough. And I felt incredibly different. But of course, I realized that of course, that made sense in my childhood. Once you leave home, you don't have to keep it going. If your life was a massive clock, your childhood is really the first seven minutes because we're told, oh, your school days are the best days of your life and it's all downhill. And I thought, actually, that's not true. It, it isn't always the best. It can be horrible for some of us and amazing for others. But I think it was re realizing that this thing about how it all looks okay, but it's really not, and how you learn what you live and... It really made me have a great understanding of what makes people tick, that your life can look amazing and that it isn't what happened. It's how you feel. So I felt like a freak. I felt so different because I was a head teacher's daughter. And imagine being 11 and going to your, and these 18 years, your dad's, uh, I, well, I won't finish the sentence because they're 18. I'm, I didn't know what to do. And everyone thought I'd be this amazing genius because I was the head teacher's daughter. But my father... I mean, he also had his own agenda. He was paid to be interested in other people's kids. And they did what he wow. said. So at home, he just, I mean, he, I don't think he quite understood that it, that isn't a 24-hour thing. It's like my daughter one day when she was little, she had a cold nose. And she said, Mommy, I just don't have medicine. Everyone says, I don't want you to give me something healing. I want medicine like all my friends. I went, okay, darling, you can have medicine. Because <laughs> I understood too that she too is like, you know, I'm a therapist and we can do this healing. We can have some lavender. No, I want cowpaw like all my friends. <laughs> like, hey, we'll yeah. go get some for you straight away. Because kids don't want to be different. And I, so I think the, the big thing about my childhood is how different I felt my whole life and realizing how what a bane of your life that is as a kid when you just want to fit in. But how many people have that? How many people feel different? You know, you feel different because you're smart or stupid, because you're rich, you're poor, because you're the tallest, because you're the first kid to develop or the last. There's so many ways we feel different. And of course, you know, I spent, I spent quite a bit of time in Africa and everyone looks the same and yeah. they don't have that because they, in a small tribe, you know who you are. But in a multicultural world, this difference really is the bane of our lives. And we magnify. And the disconnection is yeah. the other bane of our lives. And now, of course, you can get up and Instacart delivers your stuff. Uber can pick you up. You can never, you cannot speak to anyone for days. We're creating a world of like massive, massive disconnect, disconnection, forgetting that connection is our primary driving need. One question I wanted to ask you is about 2024, but maybe we should start from there. Uh, you know, it is, uh, it is in my mind, we're coming to an interesting, ch maybe challenging year, right? Economically, the signs are not great. The geopolitical situation, people are feeling it everywhere. Uh, you know, and, and, and I, I tend to believe that, you know, sometimes people get really surprised when I speak to them about 
artificial intelligence and the challenges that are ahead. And I speak about it so calmly and so optimistically and, you know, in a very interesting way, I'm actually very composed about it, almost stoic if you think about it. Uh, and I, I believe people can do that with everything in their life, that, that it, it doesn't matter if the external world is challenging, you can from within you yeah. deal with that but 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 let's start with with how we are at the end of 2023 you know is we created a world that's magnifying difference that's yeah. increasing comparison that is um really almost pinning us against everyone else instead yeah. of being part of everyone else and that's a very difficult place for the brain, the untrained brain, let's say, to to navigate. So, what's your what would you would be your advice? I mean, how can we be less irritable, less uh, angry, less against each other? Well, you know, I think a lot of us are sold this lie that you know, if you can get some control in life, then it's going to be good. If you can control your weight, if you turn up always looking like groomed and perfect, if you can control your body or your temper. Or if you can have this control, then you'll be happy. But this is not true because yeah. the only thing you can control in life are your thoughts. I can't control the traffic. Yeah. I can't control the weather. I can't even control my body, really, because if I did, I'd never get tired or sick or I'd never get a headache or I'd never get a cold. You can only control your thinking. And when you can learn to control your thoughts and make your thoughts positive, then that's a game changer. So we look at the world and go, wow, what's happening with AI and all this stuff? But the thing is, you can look at that and choose what to feel about it. And yeah. if you're not choosing to feel better, you must be choosing to feel worse. If you wake up and go, oh, gosh, the world is terrible. Look what's happening and there's war and there's stuff going on and the e e what's happening in the economy, then you're actually choosing mm. to feel bad. So everything is a choice and you always have to choose what something means. I mean, could ABI be amazing? Yeah. Could it be threatening? Yes, it could be both. And in a world where everything is changing, you have to say, but I'm not changing. I'm the same mother, the same father, the same sister, the same daughter, the same parent. Because really, you know, we had this in 9-11. We had it in the 80s when I was a dance teacher and AIDS was this epidemic. And it was like, oh, my God, every, everyone's going to die, every 10th person you imagine being a dancer in that world. I mean, I was I taught dance. I wasn't a dancer. I taught for Pineapple Dance Studios, but it was a world of a lot of gay people, and we were all told every everyone's going to know someone. And yet here we are today. People have had AIDS for 45 years. They're not dying of it anymore. It isn't the disaster. After 9-11, as bad as it was, we, we went back. After SARS, we went back. So periodically we have these terrifying things that come up. The world's going to change. Nothing's going to be the same again. And if you look historically, that actually isn't true because the world always seems to go back to back to love, back to family, back to people, back to connection. And I might sound very naive, but if you look at history, you, you see that we do always seem to come out of these terrible world wars and the things that are going on and we seem to go on, and maybe that won't happen forever. But it's a choice, you know, you have to choose. What are you looking at? Because as Wayne Dyer said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And we can all choose to look at the world and go, this is terrible, you know, the world is a disaster, and everything has changed so much in the last 20 years. But actually, everything changed so much in the 1920s when we got cars and radios and televisions and we think the last 20 years have changed but actually it was the first part of the last century where things changed so dramatically but you you mustn't give away your choice you can choose what something means even in a terrible terrible place you still get to choose what does this mean how do i feel about it you know is the world changing but can i still be the certain person can i still be myself with my right values and the right people around me. I, I love that. I love that you bring it back to, this is about what I can do with yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, with me, yeah. yeah it, and because I can't change the world, but I, can st I can't stop the world changing. But I can say I'm the same wife, mother, friend, sister that I've ever been. And 
the things that matter to me, the people I love. You know, of course, whenever anyone is dying and you ask them what matters, they, look, they don't regret what they didn't do. They always regret, I didn't spend enough time with my kids. I should have yeah. told my partner I Being loved old. them more. Yeah. And so we've got to always come back to what, what makes us happy. It's our relationships with people. Mm. It isn't how much stuff you have or how much stuff you've earned or the accolades you have. It's who do you love? Who loves you? You know, what are the things that make you happy? And, you know, for me, it's like the first cup of tea every morning, getting into clean sheets, having a bath. It, it, I find it's the simple things. Always Something is. that smells so good, you know, sitting down and eating something, having a phone call, being with people you love. And we're so busy chasing the big stuff. But actually the key to being happy is to love the, what I call an aptitude to gratitude. Mm -hmm. If you can like the small stuff, you know, every day wake up and think, oh, you know, I wake up because I live on a canal. And I wake up to the sound of ducks and birds. Now I've just moved here, but I also live in a nature reserve. And mm -hmm. so every time I wake up, I always wake up to animals. And I love that. And I find actually my own animals give me immense joy. And so you've got to look for the little things that give you pleasure and extend it and extend it. And again, if you're looking out there for something good, you're not going to find it. Anywhere you're looking that isn't in here, you're not going to find it. You have to say, what makes me happy? What gives me joy? Can I can I add on to that? You know, I would say, you know, in, in, in COVID, someone put seven abandoned kittens in my garage and they gave me so much joy. Aww. They gave me so much pleasure. They taught me a lot about psychology too because they, they were found in a car park, taken to a shelter, taken somewhere else, driven like I think two hours because I said, look, I'll take them. And then they were living in my garage, but they were completely self-contained, expected to be worshipped, would run out of their cage, covered <laughs> in so diarrhea, <laughs> climb up my leg. And they had no concept they weren't lovable. But I remember thinking, you know, when I go, I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to do this all the time. When I'm like in my eights, I'm going to take in more rescue animals. When I'm nine, I'm going to have so many animals. So I, you, you, instead of thinking, oh, gosh, when I get old, you will think, oh, well, I can have loads of animals. I'm going to have a mm -hmm. garden. I'm going to have all these wild cats living in my garden. I'm going to take in abandoned pets. So because if you find something that makes you happy, you've got to extend it and extend it. And if your first cup of tea gives you pleasure, extend it. A lot of people say, you know, I, um, I love, I'm a food lover. I go, but no, actually you're not. You're a food abuser because look at you're eating this terrible food really fast. Loving food is extending the pleasure. Enjoy every mouthful. So you go, oh, my God, this is sensational. And extend it. But you can extend the pleasure of having a bath or, you know. And then well, I was in London in the summer, and it was raining. And I, my husband and I went, and we both got into bed in the afternoon to have a nap. He was asleep. I was reading the paper. My friends were down. I was thinking, well, I'm, I'm so happy. And I thought, what is, it's raining outside, and here I am. I'm sitting, having, I'm reading. My husband's asleep next to me. And I was working out what was it about that moment that was so lovely. It was my friends are downstairs, but I'm up here. They're making dinner. I don't have to do anything. It's raining outside. I've got a lovely husband who's he's having a sleep. That's good. And I'm reading, and I don't get to read. And it was such a great moment. So You're amazing. So You've got to think, oh, well, I can do that a lot. And that's having people in my house, taking a nap, reading, all these things give me pleasure. And it's always the little things, but you've got to think, why is this making me so happy? What is it? And now how can I keep extending that? And then I'm going to feel happy all the time or almost all the time. You're amazing. You're amazing. I mean, the whole concept of many people would look at that moment and curse the, the rain and look yeah. at their husband and say, oh, look at him, lazy bastard. <laughs> and right, it, It's just you find the joy in those yeah. things. And there is joy in everything, yeah. isn't there? And it's teaching your mind, of course, to look for the joy. You know, I remember coming home a couple of years ago and um, I, I'm, I was watching War and Peace, and I was thinking, I said, God, this is, I'm so happy. I'm just sitting on my couch. It was such a great series, War and Peace. I highly recommend it. I thought, oh, I'm in heaven watching this. And, of course, what you're, you're dialing, I'm in heaven. This is amazing. This is sensational. This is so good. If you, you're training your brain, when you go, oh, this is so boring. I'm bored out of my mind here. This is so stressful. This is driving me crazy. When you say on the freeway, 
this commute is killing me. These kids are making me lose my mind. If my husband leaves his pants on one more time, I'm going to go nuts. You're actually training yourself too to be upset by little things. And the trick is to just train yourself to be thrilled by good things, you know, to say. So a couple of years ago, my daughter and her husband, it was New Year, and they said, we're going to cook. And my husband and I went to their house, and they cooked. And I said, this is my best New Year ever. I've been to so many fancy events, but just just putting on my jeans and coming here and you cooking. And they were so happy, and because I was so happy to see them so happy. But I think that was my favorite New Year. But again, what was it? Well, I didn't have to do a thing. I didn't have to get dressed up. I loved seeing how in love they were. So, mm. But it's training your brain what makes me happy, what makes me content, what makes me feel, what gives me pleasure. And then surely I can have more of that, not less of it. So simple sometimes, yeah. it really is. But I'm going to ask the, t the tough question because I think others will be thinking about it. So, you know, what if you are disapproving of the state of the world? What if others are feeling pain at the same time? Yeah, well, they are. I mean, a lot of people are in tremendous pain. I mean, the world as it is now is causing a lot of people pain, either because they're in that situation or they're looking at it thinking, I feel powerless to do anything about it, or they're numbed out and they're so overexposed to it that they, they feel bad that they're not doing more. But, you know, you can only work on you. you we can't change. You know, there's a great expression, you know, I tried to change the world and the world wouldn't change. Like, okay, I just changed my country. It wouldn't change. I thought, well, I changed my community. That wouldn't change. Change my family. On my deathbed, I finally thought, oh, too late do I realize I should have just changed myself. So the way to change the world is to change people one soul at a time to make us light. I mean, we wouldn't be going to war and competing and fighting if we all felt, I'm good, you're good, I don't have to fight with you or compete with you because I'm okay. So, you know, you, it's very hard to change the world, that's a big ask, but if you can change, and there are people doing that, changing people. We now have green schools and forest schools and green communities and people campaigning like, Greenpeace and saving the ocean. So we do have people out there changing the world. So again, it's like, am I looking at the bad stuff? Am I looking at the good stuff? There's a lot of good stuff going on. A lot of good people doing good stuff. Maybe there aren't enough of them quite yet, but still we can all think, well, what can I do? How can I do my bit? What, what can I do? And you can do something like join Friends of the Earth, join Greenpeace, join Save the Oceans. They're, you know, I have two different, different friends who both created sanitary products to save the ocean. One, one created period pants, which is an amazing thing. I mean, what an amazing product she's made. She's now making diapers that have mushrooms that eat the bacteria. They don't go to landfill. That's mm -hmm. an amazing thing. Someone has no created washable sanitary pads, which is an amazing thing. They just two girls who did this on their own. But again, it's it's you've got to be careful what you look for. If you go home and put on the news and read the paper and talk about how awful things are and how terrible everything is, then that's what you get because whatever you focus on, you get more of. Yeah. And if you think, you know, I should watch the news, but I'm just gonna turn it off today. I'm not. I'm just going to focus on nature and look at these beautiful plants, or listen to this running water. Because you, your mind can't be in two lanes. That's we're often in two lanes. I'm in this lane. The world is terrible. It's scary. It's unpredictable. It's a disaster. But there's also this lane where I have some nice friends and. I'm around nature and I'm looking at some beautiful stuff, but you can't be in both. You can't drive two cars in two yeah. lanes. So our job is to keep going into the lane that makes us feel better while also doing whatever we can Correct. to help the world. You mean, I still turn off light. My husband thinks I'm crazy. He goes, why are you turning off the lights? Even in an Airbnb, I'm like, well, that, that, I think you should. Everyone should turn off lights. And even in a hotel, I will turn off the air conditioning, turn off the lights because I think that's responsible. And he said, well, what's the point? You know, look at all these all these buildings here that never turn off the lights. I think everyone has to, you know, I still recycle. My husband says there's no point. They just put it all in the same place. 
But I think if you can feel that you're doing your bit somehow, somewhere, then you feel you're contributing somehow, even if it's a tiny thing. Yeah. It still makes it like, you know, I, I'm wherever I go, and especially I'm, I feed abandoned cats. Now I have cat food in my car. I even have it in my bag. My husband thinks it's funny. I said, but you know, if I feed that cat for a week, even though I'm never coming back here, we were in um, another country a few weeks ago, and they had these abandoned dogs on the beach, and so every day I would take them sausages and bread and feed them. I said, but, but they're learning to trust someone. Mm. And they're coming, put in there. They're so trusting in me that when I go, they'll go and do that to someone, make those big puppy eyes, and someone else will feed them. So even though I can only feed them for a week, I'm teaching them that somebody will feed them, and maybe somebody else will. And then I was feeding this one dog, and it had a that damaged egg, and it disappeared. And I was like, oh, I'm so upset. It's just gone. And I was thinking, I hope they haven't put it down. I thought, no, I'm going to believe that someone's taken it to the vet, because that's a choice. I can think, oh... Someone's taken that dog and euthanized it. Or I could say, some nice person's taken it to the vet and it's in the vet now having its leg fixed. I don't know which is true. But I know which one made me feel better and which one would have made me feel awful. Yeah. And so you, you've got to realize that if you're not choosing to think better thoughts, someone's paid for that dog to get its leg fixed. You're choosing to someone's put that poor dog down and they've killed it. Because I don't know which is right, but we, you, that's the freedom to choose. And the important thing to remember is that while I can choose what to think, if I choose to think someone has killed that dog, I, my body has no choice but to react in a bad way. So that's the point. Your body has zero choice but to react to your thoughts, but you have the choice to think better thoughts. And in thinking better thoughts, you're choosing to let your body behave. So if you think, I've got this gene, this fat gene, or this depressed gene, nothing, I've got the alcoholic gene and I'm completely screwed now for the rest of my life. The fact that you're choosing to think that, you're going to make that become true. And if you think, well, I, I don't have to have an alcoholic gene, and even if I did, I, there are a lot of ways I cannot drink, even if I have the alcoholic gene. It's like, you know, I was told I had this cancer gene, which is very unfortunate because it means your body actually doesn't know how, when it's got cancer, how to recognize it or even fight it. When they told me that, I was like, well, that's unfortunate. I was thrilled my daughter didn't have it. But then I thought, but you know, every other person gets cancer. And so statistically, the fact I have this gene doesn't really make that much difference to my chances because my chances are already 50%. And then even though I have that gene, I can still choose. I can choose not to take turmeric every day, which is really good at helping the body fight inflammation, which is a precursor to cancer. So even when you hear something really bad, you can still choose. So when I, I had cancer, I'd, I had um, endometrial cancer, <clears throat> womb cancer. But then I remember thinking, well, it's a stroke of luck because I don't need a womb. I have all the <laughs> organs to have it in. I've got it in one that's done its job. It oh hasn't God, got another job amazing. to do. Yeah. But everyone has that choice. You know, my friend said that she had breast cancer. Well, I don't need a breast. So it's better than having leg cancer or bone cancer or eye cancer. So even when something is really, you might say, bad, you still have a choice. I don't need a womb, so out of all the organs to have it in, that's actually a stroke of luck because I don't need that organ. And so you still can change again, that that's coming back to that control. If you can control what you think of something, you know, it doesn't it, people who are happy don't have charmed lives or they don't have miscarriages Absolutely. and have children who die or go through bereavement or go through being fired or dumped or replaced, or have horrible things written about them in the paper. <laughs> you know that, right? I know that. <laughs> or online. You know, I was, some, I was reading online. something, it said, that Marissa God. Peer, and I thought it said, is a grifter. I thought, well, that's nice. And then my husband said, it says, no, I thought it said grafter, which, and my husband said, no, it says grifter. Grafter. So I thought, oh, how lovely. They said, I'm a grafter. He said, no, it says grifter. And I said, oh, grifter, because I yeah. knew what that meant too. But I just thought, well, they don't know me. Because, again, you have to come back to the one choice you do have. You can't choose people to say mean things. Yeah. You can't choose for things to happen, but you can still choose, what does this mean? Can I choose how I feel? Can I choose how I react? Can I choose 
to get through this? Can I choose what I'm going to do about it? And the answer is always yes. As, as your book so eloquently said, you always have that final choice. Yeah, choice yeah. Can I choose what it means? Can I choose how I feel about it? Can I choose to look for something good about it? And the answer is always yes. And, uh, you know, like, like you said at the beginning, the most interesting part of us is that we can go much further. We can actually be more of the positive change we want to be yeah. if we don't drain ourselves yeah. with the negative thoughts that are not necessary and are not changing the world. Yeah. So, you know, in a, in a very interesting way, while, you, of course, you know, some of us will say, but I need to be informed and I need to be aware and it's hurting me when I see the news and it's doing this and it's doing that. There are ways, believe it or not, we, where you can reframe some of what you see into the of positive. Course. And there are definitely ways where you understand and within you realize that by framing them negatively, by looking at the negative side of them, you're not helping anyone. You're, you know, by screaming and shouting uh, about it uh, negatively, you're not helping anyone. No. And that as a matter of fact, your role and perhaps all of us in 2024, is to do the positive things we can do. Yeah. To, to, to just change ourselves and then change, hopefully, one person next to us, yeah. right? Positively, that's what we can do. Sitting back and feeling depressed. Yeah. Because the world is difficult, good for you. It's not making the world better. No, know? it isn't. Any, yeah. But as you say, being that mentor, being that, being that inspirational someone that goes, wow, well, look at Mo, how he coped with the death of his child, look at that person, how they coped with losing everything. Yeah. And then people think, well, if you can do it, I can do it. Because the thing about humanity, exactly. we think, if you can do it, I can. If you can jump that high, I can. If you can lose that amount of weight, I can. If you can create a business without having been to college, I can too. So yeah. it's great to give people that, oh, I can do what you do. Marissa, I will tell you, I'm sure you heard it many times before, in your presence, you are... 200 times more potent with your oh, positivity, you. with your beautiful energy. I feel tremendous love when you're speaking. I oh, really honestly you. do. You're such an amazing spirit. It really is uh, your soul, your presence is just very, very, very um, immersive. And your oh, positivity, you. your way of looking at things. I'm here between tearing up and smiling. Yeah, me too. The entire hour yeah. and a half, I feel amazing and i really think uh that the way you frame it is what it's all about yeah and th that's great news because for everyone you can frame it you always get the chance to frame it you may not get what you want but often you get the thing that you're meant to have and you know life isn't about being a millionaire and having lots of stuff it's about having people that you love and that's available to everybody. People say, where can I find love? Well, it's all around you, you yeah. know. It's it's a choice to be connected. It's a choice to talk to people. You know, there's always someone somewhere. But yeah. um, And if you choose to go out and love, then yeah. you'll be loved. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, when I moved to, to, with my husband, they said, how do you know everyone? I said, well, every time I go out, I say to people, oh, I love your dog. It's so cute. Is it from a rescue? And I, because we live in a little canal, I say, oh, you, I love your garden. It's so pretty. And your little girl is so cute. I said, my husband, it's a choice. You know, I, I choose to connect with everybody in my community. I speak to everybody because I start by saying something nice. Like, That's a cute little dog. Or what's its name? May I stroke it? And on the whole, that it is a choice. And if you choose not to speak to anyone, then you must be choosing to be disconnected. Correct. I do exactly the same in London. My husband said, how do you do that? I said, oh, well, I, <laughs> That's a her challenge. little girl, I said, I said, oh, your little baby's got such a beautiful face. She's got such a lovely spirit. And she was so thrilled that I stopped her to tell her cute. And so she always talks to me as we walk past each other. And I said, you know, even in London, you can smile at someone, say hi to someone. It, you have to choose because connection is so important to our very soul. You either choose to find it or you choose to keep perpetuating disconnection, but it's a choice. And when you choose to find it, even with the world the way it is, if you can find connection, you'll be happy and your soul will be happy. So if you did nothing else today but choose to find connection, and it's often where you least expect it. It is often when you least expect it, but it's always out there. It's always, it's available to everybody. You know that thing, the, one of the things wrong with it, I'm, I'm different so I can't connect. That's a belief. 
And a belief is nothing more than a thought you think a lot, and your thoughts are yours to challenge, change, and upgrade all the time. Well, so I have a policy on this podcast, even though I really want to break it today, is that my greatest conversations I keep short. Okay. Because I definitely think our listeners should go back and listen to it, to it all again. Sure. Many times, actually. I will listen to this one again because it's just so inspiring and it's so right. It's correct. It's the truth. It's so easy when you think about it. And interestingly, so rapid as you always yeah. call it. And, and it, is, uh, it is my wish that I invite you again a million times. Oh, I'd and, love that. And we just chat. Uh, or uh, now that you're here uh, to hopefully see you and John uh, many times, I think I, I found a that. new gem today. A uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful soul. Uh, I uh, definitely urge everyone to uh, look at uh, the teachings of Marissa. She truly is what she uh, preaches and that I think is very rare to find. I am so grateful that you came today. Thank you so Me much. Too. And for all of you listening, this is a beginning of a new year where you have one choice. I think Marissa couldn't have been clearer. And that choice is to choose what you're going to think. Uh, I'll urge you to also choose to uh, rate the podcast very highly uh, and tell others so that we can continue to spread this message. I also choose, uh, urge you to choose to plan a year where you can find some time, like Marissa was describing, in nature, with a cat, uh, with people that you love, with friends, with whoever, because as things become tough, we normally try to do more of what we know how to do best, which is not always what's best for us. I can guarantee you that when things speed up, what you need most is to slow down. So I urge you to find a little bit of time every day, every week of this year uh, to slow down. I love you all for listening. I wish you an amazing new year and I will see you next time. <music>